Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Bernadette, and I am an alcoholic and an addict. I I have a, a couple of different things wrong with me, but ultimately, I'm an alcoholic. And because I'm an alcoholic, I'm not afraid so much of what's out there. I'm not afraid of the gutter or the street or the difficulty of where we wind up with our our addiction, especially if we hit kind of a low bottom. I'm not afraid of that. What I was always afraid of growing up, I grew up in a house with many of us. There were six of us, sisters and one brother and um, my mom. And and we worked, and I'm not going to give a whole history of that because I am so happy that we are on step 11. By this time, we have already put down the drink. We have already, you know, we, we've worked already up until 10 now. Now we're looking at 11. And I love this when I saw the, um, the little picture. I wanted to keep looking at my phone of tonight's meeting and the quote and the page and the big book. And I said, oh, how interesting. This is very curious. I didn't know this was in the big book. So I went to the big book, page 87. And I'm reading the whole page 87 thing. I'm like, what is wrong with me? And um, and it's actually from the 12 and 12 on page 101. And I love this because when they're it because the spiritual life is not an intellectual exercise. It's not about the page, it's not about the right words or how am I gonna say it right? And I do want to say things right. I do want to be able to carry the message, but the message isn't mine. The message is of God. And sometimes God uses the Bernadette voice. Many times he uses the Calvin voice. I hear him use the Mickey voice. I hear him use Teresa voice. I mean, this is how God works. And as many as little squares are on this, um, you know, I always think the Hollywood squares with all these different little squares, the spirit of God via Zoom has been able to work in a manner with somebody like, um, I know, Chris Finley, who's out in California now, who I know from a Zoom meeting, and I'm able to text her and say, oh, and I'm going to share today. And she says, oh, great, I'll come. Like things like this, this don't have an and. I'm able to reach people who I haven't tangibly, physically, person to person met. And yet, they're right here. With my heartbeat, their heart's beating. And so I'll tell you a little bit of what happened that brings me to where I am with the illness in this. In, in 1987, August 11, 87, I got sober. And I, I mean, that was the day that I of sobriety that I stopped drinking and I'm using all kinds of paraphernalia. So the thing about it is that in 1989, I was at work and I'm working doing my little cubicle. And all of a sudden I couldn't see out of one of my eyes, my left eye. No, I'm sorry. My right eye completely blind as I was at work and I'm sober now. I'm newly sober. I'm two years in and couldn't see and it wasn't sure what to do so I said all right I'm going to leave I had to leave work went to the doctor and the doctor said to me okay this is optic neuritis it's like a nerve uh, it's like a virus in your eye and it could be multiple sclerosis but we really don't know and I thought oh and this again is back in 1989 this is a little while ago so then it took a little bit of time and a little bit of um this and that and a few more things started to happen and I had to go to the, and this is all sober. I'm newly young, you know, like I'm, I'm newly sober. And I had a sponsor and she, when I started to come to the meetings, it took me, you know, they say old timers now. And I always think I'm not an old timer, I'm a long timer. It took me so long to get it. I came every day for a couple of years and I was young and I couldn't, 
I couldn't put it down. I didn't yet have that gift of desperation. I was just not desperate enough until I was. And then I couldn't stop. And then where was I? I was desperate and I was suicidal and I had tried to, and I har- did harmful things to myself, all kinds of craziness in the streets, whatever. But my sponsor used to say to me every day, well, every day I would, I called her every single day, Andy, I went out again yesterday. And every day she would say to me, well, today's a new day. And whether you picked up yesterday or you didn't pick up yesterday, today's a new day and you're going to, you know, God has the ability to see us through the day. And I used to think like, did you understand me at all? I can't do this. And yet there was something about her that had me continually calling her and telling her the truth every day. And ultimately um, it got worse and worse. It always gets worse before it gets better. And then that one day I woke up one morning and I, it wasn't any different. I didn't have a different idea that I'm not going to, oh, I'm not going to go back out today. I'm not going to do any of this. No, I just didn't. I just, and I got on my knees in the exact same way. I got on my knees. And my sponsor had said to me, she was getting very afraid because I had tried to commit suicide. And her name was Andy. And she said, she was calling me dear heart. Well, dear heart, I think you better write a letter to God. And she would always tell me that. Write a letter to God. And this time you better sign on the dotted line and give me your life because this is serious. She was afraid I was really going to commit suicide to me. I might, you might succeed. I said, okay, fine. I wrote a letter to God. I signed on the dotted line. And I had this book that somebody had given me in one of the AA meetings. And it was a little meditation book. It was a little black book with gold letters, and it was the 24 hours a day book. And I read that every day, and I talked to God every day, but I just, um, I felt so far from God. I couldn't get close to God, and I didn't know how to get close to God. And I didn't even really know that I wanted to get really close to God. I just wanted for the insanity to stop. And um, Andy said to me, um, well, dear heart, I, I, I do think that if you write a letter to God and if you just keep telling God and she would just keep encouraging me. And I had the big book and I went to big book meetings and they had the 12 and 12 and I went to 12 and 12 meetings. And I one time said to Kevin Cal. I didn't do the um, big book way. I didn't do this the way my sponsor didn't go all the way through from the very beginning with the big book. And then I think like, oh, good Lord, of course. I I went home one day because I was now, I, I had two days and I went to a meeting and somebody was mad. He made fun of me. I was so upset. And I was talking about God and he made fun of me. This fellow in AA, young, I mean, we were, what, 20, he said. And, and I was so upset. I went home and I called my sponsor. And he told me, all I do is cry. And she said, well, let's say, dear heart, that you are a crier. And I thought, this is the hardest thing in the world. And she said to me, put it at God's feet. That's all she said put it at God's feet. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to put it at his feet. And I started to put everything, little by little, by big, by big, now this blind thing, two years. And I I thought like, this is crazy. I'm going to put everything at God's feet and I'm going to get up like a little child. I'm going to get on his lap and I'm going to sit on God's lap and just lean in. And see what happens. And I started to do this. Every day. Now, I wasn't drinking. I wasn't using drugs. I stopped smoking. All of this craziness. And every day, I started quietly to sit with that little black book. I first started with the meditation. I sat on God's lap. 
And every day I wept. I sat and I wept. I had, and I said that to my son. I said, ah, she doesn't make fun and I cry. And she said, let's say you're a crier. You have a lot to cry about. Wow, was that a thought? I had a lot to cry about. I did have a lot to cry about. A lot, a lot to cry about. It was a very difficult, abusive, whatever, whatever, about the background to where we get to where I'm like, can't wait to get out of high school and, and, and I'm drinking and doing crazy things. <sighs> I'm now sitting on God's lap and I told him I can't see and I don't know what's going to happen. And the doctor told me it could be MS. Maybe it's not. And I'm not even a little bit afraid. Huh. God had already done the impossible. I wasn't drinking. And I wasn't secretly wishing I could escape. I wish I could have a little something to take the edge off of my life. I didn't want to take the edge off of my life. And so I sat on God's lap. And when I tell you that I wept, I cried. And I didn't cry all day long or anything like this. I went to work. I was a regular person. But... I sat and I would cry probably for about 15 to 20 minutes in the morning, just weep. And then when my weeping was done and all my troubles are at God's feet and I'm leaning in because I'm on his lap and he's making this little sound in his voice. And everyone else thinks, yeah, like God is humming. No, no. You know what he says? My beloved, precious little Bernadette, Mm -hmm. in whom I am well pleased. My precious Bernadette. And the, the big, heavy chin of God on top of my little head, leaning in. And I would weep and tell him, everything, holding back nothing. My fears, I was afraid of everybody in AA, even though my sponsor was so nice and every, I was afraid of everybody. But what I continued to do is talk to God. And, um, and, and it says in the book, and it, the thing that I was um, focused on here, I was trying to see, you know, that, that one line of the, um, when we do meditation, when we do self-inventory meditation and prayer, interwoven becomes an uh, um, unshakable foundation for life. For life. I will tell you that um, I got the vision. Some of the vision was gone, and that was fine because my other eye was fine. But I started to have other troubles. And I lost the, I was re- training to run a marathon. I lost the ability to keep on um, walking. I needed to use a walker. I, like little by little, things were happening to me. And then bigger and bigger things kept happening to me. And, um, and Calvin's right. I was septic and I almost died. And I've been septic five times where my whole system just would shut down and I'm in the hospital and they're giving me all these antibiotics and and saying, like, you're probably not going to make it through this. And um, and I have lost power. Like, I can't move my arms properly. I can't hold a, a pen. I, I was trying to make notes for today. I was nervous. And I can't hold the pen. And um, I have trouble with the utensils. And, and I lost the ability um, with the bladder. So I... I so I have a urosmy, so I have a bag attached to me, a carry bag. And then I have no, it, it has affected my, my bowel. So I have a bag attached to me, to the bowel. And um, so I'm like the bag lady. So I have all these different little bags, and they're all attached to my chair. Uh, n- not those bags. Those bags are attached to me. But again, like if, if you knew this kind of craziness of life, life can get hard. Right. And then life can get much more difficult. 
and more difficult. And physically, it seems that the deeper I grow in my spiritual life with God, the um, less physical power I have. And I think, well, what kind of an idea is this? Like, what do you think? This is not a good idea. So I, um, I don't know if I'm making any good sense telling you about this, the way that it works. But what it works is that the one thing that I don't want is I don't want to drink. I don't want to pick up what I want as I want to grow in my relationship with God as I understand him. And when it talks about um, meditation, we cannot box God in. There's no boundary. There's no width. There's no height. We can't box him in because he's boundless. God, and I think of God as my father and I think like my world weary war-torn, broken heart. I lean in until in when my weeping is done and I am quiet and my heart begins to be in union and communion with the heartbeat of God. And he says, open your hands. Just open your hands. You stay right here with me. And open your hand. My love will pour through you. It will be in your room. It will be in the hallway. It will be out into your town. In fact, it's going to make its way around your country. And then it's going to be around the world. This is the power of God. Who knew 35 years later we would be with Zoom. And we would really be around the world with the people from everywhere hearing and listening, and even the fact that we want to tap in to a power source of love. Because the quote, and I love this, what's the purpose of meditation? To improve our conscious contact with God, with his grace, his mercy, his wisdom, Look on the page 101 towards the bottom. You'll find it there. It's all in there. And the instructions, I love that they write this 12 and 12. The essays come after the big book. I love the big book. Of course, we wouldn't have the essays without the big book. And yet, my sponsor, she's so funny. My original sponsor, she she died recently. A couple of years, two years ago, she died. Um, and she was only my sponsor for six years, but we remained good friends. And my sponsor now has been my sponsor for 30 years. She, she says to me every now and then, like, you know, Bern, just we just keep going back again and again. We keep giving it back to God, and God keeps giving it back. Like, it's the breath. As we breathe, and this is what I also believe, when we really begin to understand that just our breath is we begin to understand what prayer is and meditation is the oh uh oh is that a warning do i have to hold on one second oh it, um make you can just tell me when i have to stop talking or something because if it gets a warning if like if you were going to put a warning there just some warning on my computer screen but um i can't read because now I can't see. So so just to get on to catch up a little bit more with the MS progressing. So I can't walk. I don't have any power over the bladder. I have no power over the bowel. And 14 years ago, I had something called trigeminal neuralgia, which is an entirely different disease, uh, neuro thing, except that it feels like as if you got a shock, an electric shock. So I'm brushing my teeth and I, I looked for the outlet because I thought I was shocked. And then that repeated and it repeats and repeats. And and it's an incredibly painful, it's one of the most painful conditions um, that you can get evidently, which is why this past, so for 14 years, I've been trying to manage this with the doctors and all, all this while staying sober. 
and happy, joyous, and free. Good God, happy, joyous, and free. And my behind is killing me because I'm always sitting on it. Happy, joyous, and free. And I think like you just continue to keep moving forward. How does this happen? And I think that humility, this is why I told you about the bags. The humility is, um, is the key. Humility is the one, it dovetails its way to the entire 12 steps. Humility. Because the more humble we are, I believe, the closer we grow into who God would have us be. I believe that the humility, it's not just the humility, it's it's the willingness to be like a child. The willingness to be like a child. And I believe, and, and God said so, the kingdom of heaven is filled with little children. Who's the most important? Who is the most important? The little children are the most important. Huh. And the entry into heaven is so low that none can get in but a little child. Unless to get in, I get down on my knees and I go in humbly on my knees. And this is why I did not have the example of a father who was loving and kind and holding you. Nothing like this. My dad was not well. It was not very good. At all. It was horrible. But, um, and, and, you know, the state came in. It was not good. But I have seen it. I have seen fathers and babies or adults or mothers with their children. But I think the father, I've seen it. I know what it looks like. I watch it. It, did, it wasn't my example, but I can, I can embrace this example. I can welcome this idea because when God puts his arms around me, you know what it's like to sit on, uh, did you ever sit on, on somebody's foot and like have them walk when you're a kid and you sit on their foot and hold on to their leg? I hold on to God's leg and sit on his foot. I think, well, I can't walk, but I go all over the world on God's foot. This is like just this kind of um, childlike trust and, and developing in that relationship with God. It seems that the more childlike we become, the more uh, mature, the kinder we are. I am. And I am not so quick to judge anybody for anything. I always think why, because I had to do that ninth step. Forgive everybody, everything, all the time. <laughs> that it, it just works well. And I just, I, I think to myself, like, I judge no one, not for any reason. Why? Because I know myself. Why do I not judge? I know myself. I continue to go back and my heart continues. I lean in and I feel God and I can feel him swallow. And every now and then I stand up on his lap and I think, oh, do you have an ear? Huh. Imagine if God has an ear. Can I see your ear? Huh. And, and I play these things with God. And I had this one friend in a meeting and he was so shy and he was so quiet. And he only had like two or three teeth. And then he only had one tooth. And I said, Charlie, what happened to your teeth? Now you only have one. And he was one of my dearest friends. And I used to think, I think that God, what if God had one tooth? Ah. And I would say to God, well, you know, you have all the power in all the world. You have the ability to get us sober and keep us walking on this path. And you have one tooth? Like, what's with that? And, and he just kind of laughs and he smiles and he nods with his one tooth. Imagine if we could put, if, if the God of all power and wisdom has one tooth, then certainly there's room 
for all people who have all kinds of weird things. And it's not just because I'm in a chair and I can't, and I have my dives and I'm, it's not like that at all. It's almost as though um, God just wants to keep showing me these new things. So to get back to this trigeminal thing, it is a pretty serious thing. And I had to have a brain, I didn't have to have a brain surgery, but in order to stop being shocked like that, I had this in March 15th, I had this very serious brain surgery. And one of the um, results is that, uh, well, half of my face, I can't really feel it, um, my left side now. And so, you know, you bite your cheek or whatever on the inside. This is not the worst thing. The difficulty is that an unexpected, um, so unexpected problem uh, or, you know, development is that I can't see out of my good eye, out of my left eye. So now I can't really see out of my right eye and I can't see at all out of my left eye. And now I'm seeing specialists to see if they can get my vision back. And I, this is not easy. I don't mean to say like, oh, and I'm just fine and things can keep happening. No, I still go. And, and now of all things, this is the craziest thing. I only get tear out of one eye. Crazy, right? But it's the way it is. Is it acceptable? Is it okay? If you know what it's like to lean into the heartbeat of God and feel the power and strength of the arms and the, and the will and the, the very beating of God's life, then there's no fear. We don't need to be afraid. It doesn't mean there's no sorrow. I have great sorrow. I'm sorry it's like this. I'm sorry for my husband. This wasn't the plan. This was not what we were going to do. We were not going to certainly be. We were I, training to run the marathon. He ran the New York City Marathon. I didn't get to run. But that's okay because God has me running other things. And even that, do you see the incentive? Like, how crazy is that? But that's okay. So now. Here I am with this crazy, crazy life and crazy body. And, and I don't sit well at a table and I don't quite, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of physical things that, um, that I have, have helped with. I can't stand to sh shock, to shift or to get myself. And I think, oh, but I can take my own shower. No, not really, but sort of. <laughs> Enough, you know, like, and I think, and and then I come out of the shower, my husband wants to know, so you ready to work out? And I'm like, oh, don't you think putting my shoes on was the workout? And yet, there is joy in the moment. Every day, there is room for joy. Happy, joyous, and free. This does not mean that there is no sorrow or there is no difficulty. There is difficulty. There is sorrow. And yet, and you know the one part in the book where it does say, deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. I believe this because it's true. It's true. It's an individual adventure. It's an individual adventure. This adventure with God. That's also in the book. Right around that same, look at page 101. Very interesting. It says that in there. It's very interesting about meditation, about what is meditation, the purpose and the point of meditation to get back in touch. That ultimate, what is that 11th step? Oh, yes. Well, we're going to continue the prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact. It's interesting how tw step 12 Step 12, you know, does not say haven't stayed sober as a result of these 12 steps or haven't gotten our, our lives in order and having things worked out, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of all of these 12 steps. It's very interesting. Very interesting. This is all about God's love for us. And ultimately, I think, 
that it is in his love for us. He, he, he just, he can't get enough of us. He just can't get enough of us. And I've seen parents with little children. They are the world with this little child. And I think this is how God is with us, with each of us, no matter what our condition is, no matter what we look like, no matter what we think or call God. And my friend said to me, well, my sponsor is a she believes in Buddha. And what do you think of that, Brother Dad? Because I know you're a Christian. What do you think of that? She, he, she calls him Buddha. She keeps repeating this. Finally, I said to her, yes, yes, I understand. This is fine. I think you can call God Buddha. I think you can call him Ahla. You can call him Muhammad. You can call him Jesus. You call God what you want to call him as long as you call him. I don't think he's interested in what we call him. I don't think he's interested in how we see him or what it's an individual adventure. Find his nickname. Get to know God enough so that you have your own personal nickname. He has yours and you know his. And there is no separation There is nothing that can come in between. Nothing, no disease or illness that can happen to me can get in between my heart and the love of God. God is for all of us everywhere, in everything. Every day I ask him, open the eyes of my heart and the ears of my spirit. So I might see you in everyone and in everything, good and bad, everyone, people I like, people I don't. Huh. I'm going to hear you in the sound and in the silence. We will never be separated from God all because we couldn't stop drinking and our lives were quite a mess quite a mess and we needed help and we had to ask and we said all right well and we had to ask and I do believe that God in his infinite wisdom and love knows exactly how to touch the very strings of our own hearts and keeps us safe Safe, safe, safe. So I see it's 846. Is that my time? All righty. There you go. Thank you so much for listening to me. I hope I brought you an okay message. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.